you very much, and it's great to be with you today and having heard some wonderful talks, including some which uh, have stolen my thunder, <laughs> Richard Wilkinson in particular. But I think I'll repeat the slides rather than editing them because it may just reinforce the points that he has uh, so eloquently made. I need this to go forward. We've heard the bolding quote, or a version of it, there seems to be a lot of them floating around and I'm not sure which is the most accurate one, but it does point to the fact that really we can't continue to think about exponential growth uh, in any serious-minded way and any um, intelligent reading of our position is either you know, by uh, the rest of us or a madman or economists. I do like bashing economists. I started in economics and left it uh, once I decided that the model of human behaviour that they relied upon was so far from even the little I knew at the time. But I do want to talk a little bit about what Tony uh, Jack said uh, in his book, Ill Fares the Land. Uh, Jack, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but he, in the introduction to that book, said something is profoundly wrong with the way we live today. And I think it's important not to lose sight of these moral and ethical questions when we're thinking about the whole question of growth and prosperity and human well-being. He went on to say that for the last three decades we made a virtue out of the pursuit of material goals to such an extent that this very pursuit, and I quote him, now constitutes whatever remains of our sense of collective purpose. That's a very dismal message in some ways, but it is one of the things that we have to overcome if we're to make some of the changes that we've been talking about here. And he went on to suggest that this pursuit is now firmly entrenched in an orthodoxy which judges achievement and public policy in exclusively economic rather than in moral terms. I might say I was surprised to come back to universities and found that they were doing the same thing, that the bean counters had taken over. The result is that when we consider whether to support a particular proposal or initiative, we don't ask whether it's good or bad, whether it will help bring about a better society or a better world or an improved environment, but rather how it will affect the economy. First question is asked and the last word very often. We ask how it will affect the economy, whether it's efficient, whether it will lead to increases in GDP, and if so, by how much. These are critically the questions that we address in the press uh, and in government. And most politicians, it has to be said, and political commentators, uh, don't regard this as a problem. And the, the equation of well-being, in other words, they're, they're assuring us that improving the economy will improve our well-being. That equation of well-being with economic growth is taken as a given. And the identity of society with the economy is uncontentious. And that's, again, one of the problems we have to overcome in the political class. Indeed, they don't see any alternative to this construction. It's simply the way the world works. You often hear the phrase, there's no alternative. Almost without exception, politicians, business people, journalists and financial commentators regard the need for economic growth as unarguable. In fact, to raise questions about economic growth as we're doing here at this conference, and as you do probably in your daily lives, is to risk banishment from contemporary political discussion. And I'm sure some of you have had that effect as well. But as Chuck pointed out, this avoidance of moral considerations in assessing public policy and the restriction of policy uh, discussions to those narrow economic ones of profit and loss is not an inevitable human tendency, but as he put it, an acquired taste and a recent one at that. I want to also uh, go on before I go to the, the guts of my talk to quote James Galbraith, the son of John Kenneth, who's been working on the whole question of inequality for a very long time. I don't know if you know his uh, project in Texas, his Texas Inequality Project, but it's, it's a very careful uh, global analysis of the growth of inequality. And in looking across history and across nations, uh, Gal Galbraith has concluded, in general, increasing inequality is a worrying sign that something is going wrong and a pretty good indicator throughout history that untoward developments may be on the horizon. I know it's that horizon we're trying to look over today. One of the things on the horizon that we've underestimated is the increase in population. I don't know if you saw the recent paper in Science uh, just a couple of weeks ago that model population increases. There's been an acceptance that we've, we've reached a pretty high level. 
of about 9 billion by uh, 2050. The recent modelling suggests it's more likely to be 11 billion by the end of the century, at least, and maybe earlier than that. The suggestion is that many of our models have underestimated the population impact, and as we've seen, population is one of the big drivers of economic change and one of the big effects on the quality of people's lives. Living in congested cities in slums is no fun. Underlying, of course, our analysis is the whole question of consumption, and we've had some very learned papers on this already. I haven't looked at literature to find out about human behaviour rather than formal psychological or sociological investigation, partly because it's easy to read. Um, but Tennessee Williams has Big Daddy say this, and I think it's a very important insight into what, in a sense, drives outside consumption. The human animal is a beast that dies. And if he's got money, he buys and buys and buys. And I think the reason he buys everything he can buy is that in the back of his mind, he has the crazy hope that one of his purchases will be life everlasting. And I think that's the hope that's been offered to us. It's about status, as Richard Wilkinson says, but it's also about denying our own mortality. And we are a death-denying society. I wouldn't underestimate the extent to which those two things are linked together. And of course, as Tennessee Williams has Big Daddy say, which it never can be. But nonetheless, we're consuming at a rate. It's destroying various bits of the planet. And at the same time, affecting the quality of our lives. I just want to draw attention to the very substantial work now that's been done on the effect of a degraded environment on human well-being. We just heard that this shouldn't be the only consideration, and of course it should not be. But when we're destroying the environment, we're also uh, diminishing our own lives. So that we know, for example, already, that with increased heat, you have increased psychiatric emissions. And the countries most at risk from these big increases in heat, like Australia, are already seeing some of those mental health effects. Though, mind you, it's not, as the ABC suggests, that half of us suffer from mental illness. That's not actually a very helpful observation. <laughs> um, we know that in positions of persistent noise, we get increased anxiety and poorer health. I mean, you only have to sit here now and you can hear that noise coming in through. Quiet in cities is a rare phenomenon. And we're constantly on the alert and under stress in environments like that. With higher levels of pollution, we have lower levels of subjective well-being, including in places like China, where there's been some very interesting work done. The Chinese cities that are not polluted are the ones that have citizens who are more satisfied with their lives. And by the way, they have better health as well, for obvious reasons, because of the pollution levels in some of those big cities. The destruction of the natural environment also results in higher rates of depression. There's a very interesting work in Australia, which some of you may be familiar with, shows that in the Hunter Valley, as the coal industry impinged on people's lives, the rates of suicide, um, mental health problems, and alcohol abuse increased. And people generally reported their lives to be unhappy. And we know that's a consequence of a, a place, a precious place, being destroyed. And you'll know Glenn Albrecht's work on soul nostalgia, the loss of a place. It's not nostalgia, it's actually having a place that you love destroyed underneath your feet. So these are human consequences which are not, in a sense, likely to be well being. We also know that contact with the natural environment is good for us. Faster recovery from surgery, even just looking out the window of your room. Children with behaviour problems, give them a walk in the park, it's better than taking dexamphetamines. Similarly with adults, if you take a walk in a green space over lunch, your attention span will be restored and you'll be better able to work. We know that at some level, but it's actually very important for us to have that connection with the natural environment. It's where we evolve, it's where we feel most comfortable. And yet what we're doing and exporting our waste to other places to make their lives miserable. I don't know if you've seen this uh, image of uh, Accra in Ghana, place appropriately called Solomon Gomorrah, recycles electronic waste, most of which has been illegally dumped there from Europe and also from Australia and the United States. You can actually see the names of the companies and the corporations and the uh, local governments that this comes from. Children pull apart this waste, burning a lot of it, and the life expectancy of the children on that dump is 14. Okay, so are we really making progress? You've seen this uh, indicator before the genuine progress indicator that was calculated in Australia, there are various versions of, us, of it that show that if you measure real progress, and that includes improvement in the quality of life, a phrase that we don't often hear discussed very often, then we've been flatlining since the 70s. And it doesn't matter which developed country you look at, you'll find that phenomenon 
expressed in another way, ecological footprint uh, on the bottom axis shows us that it doesn't matter how big it gets, our life satisfaction is unchanged. And again, we've seen that point reinforced. And we've seen this graph before too, showing the relationship between happy life years, so-called. Economists do some pretty awful things with some of these indices, by the way, and probably they will be challenged when the science is done properly. But nonetheless, uh, happy life years by GDP. After a very limited uh, period of income increase, you don't get any substantial change. And in that upward part, of the world, people are getting better education, better health, um, better human services, and of course, as a result, their lives are better off. But after that, it doesn't really make much difference. And you can see the same relationship expressed slightly differently. So that happiness um, related to CO2 emissions, the more CO2 emissions you produce, uh, the less happiness there actually is. So it's an inverse relationship, uh, and that's probably because in those circumstances where there's a lot of consumption, people are living in cities, working too hard, commuting too long, generally speaking, not living lives that are inherently satisfying. So inequality. Um, Inequality has been rising around the world. That's an OECD graph, and you can see, without pointing to particular countries, that all of them, except a couple, have been increasing in inequality. And that includes Australia. And I just want to point out, as people have hinted at, the close link between that rising inequality and a particular way of thinking about economic activity, growing liberalism, as it's called, um, uh, or neoliberalism as we came to know it. I'm going to be a bit more here, excuse me. So the economic model that we've come to accept as inevitable has produced these outcomes. Which is why we have to get politicians involved as well, by the way. We can't avoid that. Okay. So the effect of this in various parts of the world has already been dramatic. Growing inequality around the world. In the United States, this work by Oshlansky and others shows that it's not just that the rate of improvement in the quality of people's lives has flattened or not improved dramatically. The red shows the parts of the United States where white males, we're not talking about African Americans here, their life expectancy in some of those poorest places has been going backwards for a while. But white males in the United States are actually living less than their parents and grandparents. Okay, so let's have a little look at inequality. In, co in communities where there's high levels of inequality, people are less satisfied with their lives, they're less happy. The Gini coefficient down the bottom is the usual measure of inequality. The mean happiness levels up the side. So the bigger the, the uh, inequality, the higher the level of um, unhappiness. And this is, an, in this case, is an American, sorry, is an American um, study. And if you look at the years where you had pretty good levels of, if you like, happiness, because this is trend data, they are in the 70s again, re reinforcing that view that things haven't really got a lot more better when you look across here at the 2000s and 90s, where happiness levels are lower. The question then is who gains from the growth in income? And this is where it's important to consider public policy. If you look at Australia, the bottom 90% there, okay? The USA is the worst. It's always the model of inequality at its, at its rawest. But Denmark and Sweden, and even France to some extent, with the growth that was going on, at least the distribution in the income suggested that some of the people lower down were getting a little bit of the growth. Whereas in Australia, it wasn't particularly large. And you've seen an American version of this graph which shows how people think about income inequality in Australia. The actual, I'm sorry, the actual um, distribution is up here. That's the top 20%, second 20%, all the way down, you can barely see it to the bottom 20%. This is what people in Australia estimated, and this is what they thought was ideal. Australians are probably amongst the most egalitarian in the expression of views that they have. And I think this is an important point. So people don't appreciate how unequal we are, and yet they aspire to something that's reasonable, reasonable in, in terms of the distribution of income. This gives you just a feel for the trend data in Australian inequality. That's the top 1%, the top 0.5%, and the top 0.1%. Steadily increasing the share of income. 
And that summarises it neatly. Wages shares have been going down, very similar to the, in some ways to the graph that Richard Wilkinson shows, with the decline in the union movement as well. Profit share has gone up and the wages share has gone down. And of course, at the same time, we've had very significant increases in pay of Australian CEOs. So the ratio has dramatically changed from about three or four to one to 60 or 70 to one, depending on which data you look at. And again, you've seen this uh, slide, but I just want to leave it here to point out the position of Australia, the relationship between inequality and this index of various social ills that Wilkinson and Pickett devised. Here's Australia here. And that position, by the way, has been steadily worsening. Similarly, uh, the child well-being relationship that Wilkinson and Pickett pointed to, Australia, surprisingly in the eyes of some, doesn't do very well here at all. We're fairly unequal in the OECD countries, and our index, uh, the UNICEF index of child well-being shows that we're not, we're not near the top. And by the way, that's not explained by the position of Indigenous children in our country. They're not numerous enough despite the severe disadvantage to account for that effect. And one of the reasons for this, and I want to draw close attention to this, is the relationship between family policy generosity, that's this index here, and in this case, infant mortality. Look where Australia is. Again, we like to think of ourselves as a socially progressive country, but compared to these OECD countries, and that's where most of these data come from, it's comparing the like more or less with the like. And that's where, by the way, Pickens' graph on uh, waste recycling came from the OECD countries it's looking at. So what you see here is that, sorry, Australia uh, is not particularly good on family policy generosity, but there's a relationship, as you can see. The more support there is for families, the lower the infant mortality. And there are lots of graphs like that showing the health effects. So why does inequality affect health? Firstly, the social capital hypothesis that we've heard talked about. There are lower levels of social support in unequal societies. Access to resources is unequal. Participation in politics is uh, unequal. In fact, it's down altogether. Uh, people don't have emotional support. Their self-esteem is threatened. And their mu the mutual respect is absent in those societies. Um, Wilkinson and Pickers talk, talk a lot about status anxiety, that um, these are highly unequal societies damage people via perceptions of their place in the state's hierarchy, that they feel feelings like shame and distrust, and that leads to physiological effects, especially early in life, that can persist through a lifetime. But I think it's important not to underestimate systematic underinvestment in social infrastructure and services uh, that the neo-materialist hypothesis is so called went to. I think, in fact, it's all of the above. All of these things are probably operating in unequal societies to produce some of the ill effects that we've seen described. I just want to talk briefly about one of the experiments that's taking place in the world today. I don't know if any of you had a chance to read um, uh, Stuckler and Gusty's book, The Body Economic, but I recommend it. In it, they describe uh, various case studies, events that have happened in recent times, comparing austerity and stimulus approaches. Austerity we know about, cuts to government spending on health care coverage, assistance to the unemployed and housing support, for example, in Greece and the United Kingdom. And at the same time, and we would put ourselves here probably, stimulus uh, uh, effects, investments in health and social safety net programs occurring with the financial crisis. And they find, not surprisingly, that in this case, there's a whole cluster of health and health effects with that growing inequality in Greece, which again, reverses in life expectancy, uh, underinvestment in health, people dying from infectious diseases for the first time in a very long time, catastrophic effects. The other experiment that they point to, which is fascinating, this is the relationship between uh, mass privatization, in this case in Russia, a more moderate case uh, in Belarus, and not as extensive, this is if you like the, the baseline, looking at the relationship between the uh, time that this was occurring in, and these are standardized mortality rates. They did a lot of work on this. This gap here, all these dead people, that's what it is. A whole lot of people died in the decade from 1990 to 1992 to 2001, effectively, with a drop off here. There are some estimates that that number of premature deaths is about 100 million in Russia. Mainly men, 
and mainly in circumstances where whole industries were closed down. Now, this is a two-sided story. It's about inequality, it's about austerity measures, it's about sudden economic change. But it's also a bit of a warning to us. If we want, as some do, and even anticipate that we'll end up with some crisis that causes us to change the way we look at this planet and its sustainability, that may well be one of the things. That when we talk about catastrophe, we're meaning human deaths. And that's a message that we should get across. This is a bit mischievous, but this work was done in Australia, so I thought it was worth pointing to. This is actually a combination of various governments at state and federal level. If you look here, this work was done showing suicide rates between 1901 and 98, taking out various effects, including of depressions and wars. So it controls for all the right things. When you have two Labor administrations, state and federal, in New South Wales, that's the, the index one, mixed one of each, the rate goes up. When you've got two conservatives, it's disastrous. <laughs> I mean, in some ways it's not great, but uh, it tells you something about public policy. And it tells you something too about the way people think about themselves. I've got a minute to go. So I'm just going to skip over that slide and suggest to you that in all of these circumstances, the critical variable is the activism of government. So the public expenditure per 100,000 of population and male mortality. Governments have an important role to play here. And let's not underestimate the need to influence the citizens, if you like, of our parliaments. They're people just like us. They can follow arguments and they should be brought into the conversation to be persuaded that these are the sorts of phenomena that we can't as a community sit by and allow to develop as we confront the resource constraints, the effects of pollution and the inevitability of falling off the growth cliff unless we take preventive action. Thank you. <laughs>